Sorry. Um, hi, everyone. So we're going to get started with today's event. Um, welcome to Lunch from the Lab, a panel discussion on the ethics and realities of culture of meat. Um, I'm Jen from VegFest. I just wanted to take a second to welcome everyone. Uh, this event is part of the 2021 Virtual New England VegFest. Our festival is currently in its 11th year. Um, this is the 11th year we have run our festival. And um, Um, we are, we have a great committee who has come together to put together, um, an event that to bring the best experience we can to everyone involved. Um, I do want to take just one second to thank our many sponsors of the event. Um, thank you so much to Be Real Cookie Dough, for Apothecary, Franklin Farms, Photo Foods, Made Simple Skin Care, No Pig Neva, Spirit of Change Magazine, Supreme Master TV, Uprise Foods, Vegan Johnson Journeys, Vegan Mainstream and Workers Credit Union, as well as um, grant support from a well-fed world and veg fund. Um, please take a moment to vid visit our website at anyvegfest.org. If you haven't been there, we have lots of stuff going on. You can learn more about our sponsors as well as many exhibitors and um, a plant-based pavilion and marketplace that has lots of discounts, as well as a virtual scavenger hunt. Um, we have vegan cooking demos that you can watch. And um, we're also doing a vegan week in our hometown of Worcester with discounts all week. Um, we have a couple more events coming up later this week. Um, Colleen Patrick Rougeau is joining us for a talk at 1 p.m. on Friday. She's a joyful vegan. We're doing another panel on the arts for the animals on Saturday the 31st. And we are ending our event with a large speaker showcase on August 1st at 12 p.m. Um, and I just want to um, take a moment to also thank all our panelists um, who can start joining us now, as well as um, our host, Victoria Moran, who is going to be moderating and also um, really just put in a lot of effort and work into this panel. So I'll hand it over to you. Oh, and one other um, point is that we're running this panel on our Facebook page at Any Veg Fest, as well as the website. And if people want to ask questions, which we'll give to the panelists um, in the last 15 minutes, um, please do so in the Facebook chat. So thank you. Hi, everybody, and welcome to this jazzy panel lunch from the lab. <laughs> I'm Victoria Moran of Main Street Vegan and really honored to be leading this discussion, convening this discussion on something that is a more controversial topic than I think a lot of people who are vegan or in the plant-based world would understand. I am joined today by two academics and an artist. I guess we could have called the panel that and I'll be introducing each of them. Um, just very briefly, and they can tell you more about themselves. We'll first be hearing from Glenn Gaudet, PhD. He holds the Kozovich Chair in the Department of Engineering at Boston College. Then we will hear from the artist, from filmmaker Liz Marshall. You know her from her beautiful film, The Ghosts in Our Machine. And she is now also the producer and director of Meet the future. And Liz is coming to us from Canada, I believe Vancouver today. And then our third panelist is John Sanbomatsu, PhD. He's Associate Professor of Philosophy at Worcester Polytechnic Institute. So the way this will work is that we're going to have 10 minutes from each of our panelists. And then we're going to have some discussion just among them. And then we'll go to your questions and what you have to add to this really important discussion. So without further ado, Dr. Glenn Gaudet. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And um, thank you for the invitation to uh, be part of this exciting panel. Um, let's see, let me start off by sharing my screen. There we go. Hopefully you can see that there. Um, and so I titled uh, my talk, um, Growing Meat in the Lab from Spinach. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the work we've been doing and, and the need for it, and a little bit about um, you know, really focusing more on the science and how we got here. Um, so my background is in tissue engineering, and so I come at it from a tissue engineering point of view. Um, why tissue engineering? Well, 
there's more than 100,000 patients on the organ transplant waiting list at any given time. Uh, and this, uh, this, this gap between uh, what's needed and what's available continues to grow. And so uh, patients are dying, unfortunately, every day waiting for a transplant. And so tissue engineering has the potential to overcome this by growing new tissues and new organs. And my lab uh, in the past has focused almost exclusively on trying to grow new heart tissue. Um, and so if you look on the right on the upper uh, panel, hopefully you can see uh, some cells that are actually contracting here. And so you can see some movement. Those there are uh, induced uh, pluripotent cells that have been turned into heart, human heart muscle cells. And we know that because the picture on the bottom the green staining uh, represents the uh, heart muscle cells. And so we're able to basically take cells from a patient, turn them into contracting heart muscle cells and actually get them to contract. And now we're figuring out how can we turn that into human heart tissue so that we can then uh, hopefully provide a solution for many of these patients that are on the transplant list. So that's my background and um, my journey into growing meat in a lab began uh, from some of our work where we used a spinach leaf and we stripped away all the plant cells. And so the movie you see here on the left with the red dye going through the leaf, that's an actual spinach leaf that we took away all the, the cells from, but we kept that vascular structure in place. And so the vascular structure is really important um, in terms of a scaffold for growing human heart tissue, but also growing any type of tissue. And so we found that in the spinach leaf. And uh, because of that work, I got invited to give a talk at Cardiff University, and so hence the map. Um, and I flew into London, and rather than taking another flight over to, over to Cardiff, I decided to, to take the train and stop off at the University of Bath and visit a colleague of mine, Marianne Ellis, whose uh, photo is shown here. And it was uh, during that trip that she told me about her exciting work um, growing meat in, the, in her lab and what she was trying to do. Um, and when I got back to, uh, to Massachusetts, uh, I read up a little bit on her work and some of the work that was being done at the Good Food Institute by uh, Liz Speck and her colleagues here. Um, and Liz is a phenomenal uh, scientist and also started reading up and uh, attended some uh, meetings sponsored by New Harvest. And around that same time, Paul Shapiro's book, uh, Clean Meat, had just come out, and uh, he was kind enough to send me a copy of it. And I read through it, and I said to myself, gosh, this is, this is a big problem, and can I actually help? Can I actually make a difference? Um, and, you know, what is the, the problem? The problem is that uh, we're really killing our environment, right? And animal agriculture is one of the significant contributors to that. Of course, we need to feed the world. We need to feed the world without killing it. Um, the world's population, as I'm sure you know, continues to grow. It's expected to grow to 9.7 billion people by 2050. And that's not too far away. Um, animal agriculture is responsible for 14.5% of the man-made greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in addition, about 70% of all agriculture land is, is used for farm animals. And so we can, and quite frankly, we have to, for the sake of our future, we have to do better. Um, and so this is where, where I stepped in and said, gee, you know, can I contribute to this field? Um, and to be able to you know, think uh, and, and hopefully um, contribute to really you know, helping change our environment for the better uh, was a great opportunity for me. And so I've become more involved in cellular agriculture or clean meat or cultured meat, basically growing meat in a lab. And so what does it take to grow it? A lot of things um, is the bottom line, but I'm gonna walk you through some of the, the science kind of at a higher level. When we talk about growing meat, we can start off with the bioreactors. Think about the bioreactors we're gonna grow them in. What does this look like? It's a big vat. I dream that one day, if you go to microbreweries and you see the big stainless steel vats that they have there, one day that they will be full of essentially lab-grown meat and you can just get your meat that way there instead of having to, to kill animals to, to get the meat. 
So that's a, essentially a bioreactor. We need to think about how we're going to get oxygen to all the cells that are growing because as a cell grows, it requires oxygen. And so that means perfusion. We're going to have to filter it. We're going to have to think about how fast we can grow those cells and then differentiate them or turn them into muscle cells. In addition, we want to think about the source of cells. What cells are, going, are we going to use? Where are we going to get them from? How fast are they going to proliferate? How are we going to proliferate them? How are we going to turn those cells then into the muscle cells that make up meat? And what about other types of cells? We also want to think about fat cells and how are we going to combine the fat cells with the, the meat cells, with the muscle cells? We also want to think about the regulatory industry. And so we've got to be careful here. We've got to make sure that we're producing meat that is not going to harm people when they eat it. And so that's part of the job of the FDA and the USDA. And so we need to make sure that we're working with these agencies. We also got to think about the here in the states, the US Congress, but also the state congresses, state uh, uh, legislative uh, branch, because they can enact policies that will essentially either outlaw lab grown meat or uh, change it so that it's really not what we intend for it to be. And so we, we've got to work closely also with uh, our policy officials. When we think about the media or the solution that these cells are grown in, there's a lot of cost associated with that. We talk about growth factors, we can add different things. So the media essentially is the Gatorade that the cells grow in. How much sugar do we need to put in there? What kind of growth factors do we need to include so we can make them grow fast, but then turn into muscle cells. Um, and it's important here, if we're really looking for an eventual solution that is completely animal free, other than the starting cells, how do we get away from serum? Serum's currently used in most cases to grow cells. And so that comes from animals. And so can we get rid of the, the serum? And then our work is really focused uh, mostly on the scaffolds. What are we gonna grow this meat on? Our, our body is made up of cells that are anchored essentially to what's called an extracellular matrix. And so a scaffold, we can think about uh, the cost. We can think about uh, whether these scaffolds should have a vascular network, kind of like I just showed earlier. Um, are they edible scaffolds or do we degrade them afterwards? And so these are some of the science and it's beyond science, but some of the issues that, that we're grappling with. Our work um, in, this, in this area is really focused on growing uh, initially bovine cells on decellularized plants and decellularized spinach. Our thought is we take a small biopsy from a cow and then we sew the cow back up and we take a very tiny uh, biopsy, less than uh, the size of a dime. And from that, we can grow up lots and lots of cells, enough to produce you know, pounds and pounds of meat. And once we grow those cells though, in order for them to grow, they wanna to adhere to something. They wanna anchor onto something. That's where the scaffold comes in. And so in our case, we're using decellularized spinach. So they anchor onto the spinach substrate and then they grow. And so we've uh, shown in, um, we just published this paper here and, and what you can see on the left here, this long, um, line essentially is a cow muscle cell that was grown from a small biopsy, a small chunk of, of uh, muscle from a cow. And uh, let's see, let me get this. On the right here, you can see the end of it actually contracting. It's the same uh, uh, video. It might be out of sync on the, uh, on the left that's on the right, but you can see it zoomed in a bit and actually contracting. And so that's a real cow muscle cell a myocyte, a muscle uh, a cell that was grown um, in the lab. And so now we're trying to grow those on skeletal, uh, on uh, uh, spinach leaves. And so what you see here on the left is an image of all these cells and the, the cells are shown the blue dots, the blue circles essentially are the nuclei. The green is a, a structure a structural protein that's found inside the cells. And so when you see a lot of green and blue on the left, that means you get a lot of cells. On the right, we used a different green marker. This green marker tells us if they're actually muscle cells. And so 
after the cells proliferate, after they grow, then we turn them into muscle cells. And so what you see on the right are those cells starting to turn into muscle cells, right? Um, and what, what you can see are some, some cells that are muscle cells that have the green, the, the blue dots again with the green, and some cells that haven't turned into muscle yet. And those are the blue dots without any green near them. We've also used other scaffolds. For example, lettuce. Here's a, an image of lettuce. And I'll just go through a couple of these quickly. Um, jackfruit. We've also grown these cells on jackfruit. We've grown them on broccoli and the broccoli florets, the tips of broccoli. Our eventual goal is to make this bioreactor where we can input the cells, which I showed you earlier, are actually contracting, and add them together with this decellularized uh, uh, scaffold and then create meat at the end of the process. Um, and so that is kind of summarized in this slide here. Um, but there are many problems that are still limiting the field. There's you know, simple things like the technical acuity required for this. Right now, you pretty much need a biology degree um, to do this type of work. It's a very expensive to grow the meat. Whether we're talking about the cells or the media, the scaffold, it's labor intensive and that costs money. We don't know if the consumer will accept it. We don't know the regulatory path. That's still up in the air. How is the USDA and the FDA going to work together uh, on this process? And what are we doing next? The take-home message from you know from this 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 part of my talk, really, in this entire talk that I gave, at least, is that we need to go beyond the engineering. I'm a I'm an engineer, but this problem takes much much more than engineering. So we need to think about uh, social scientists, we need to work closely with social scientists, food scientists, environmental scientists, political science, a whole long list of, of, of people. We also want to involve the farmers and the ranchers. We don't want to put them out of, uh, uh, you know, out of a livelihood, right? So we've got to think about that there. The bottom line is we want to work with anybody who wants to make the world a better place. Um, and so this on the right hand is a little schematic of what we're trying to do. So. Finally, I've been very fortunate to collaborate with a lot of folks at a lot of different institutions. Um, and it really, it, it takes an entire group, not just an individual. I am you know, honored to be able to present this on behalf of, of all my colleagues. You know, thank you for your time. Um, Victoria, back over to you. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating. And now we're going to move uh, from science to art and speak with filmmaker Liz Marshall, whose latest film, Meet M-E-A-T, The Future, is about this very topic. Welcome, Liz. You are muted. Oh, there. Good. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, so I'm going to do a screen share here. Um, hope it's working. Is that working? It's can working beautifully. Can you see it? Okay, perfect. So this is my latest film. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm coming to you from Canada's West Coast, uh, the unceded territory of the Seashell and the Squamish peoples where I'm privileged to uh, be working and living right now. And this is my latest film, it's called Meet the Future. So we've just got a, a screen grab here from the website, which is meetthefuture.com. It's a film that has been a labor of love uh, since 2016. And, um, you know, I believe that we are at the brink of a new era in so many ways. It's a multifaceted issue. Um, it's intersectional. It brings together all the things that I'm passionate about as a human being, as a filmmaker, as an artist, uh, animal rights, environmental justice, and human health and human rights, and planetary uh, hope and solutions. Um, I will do another screen, screen share now. Um, to talk about uh, my relationship to this film. 
uh, which is a five-year project um, so far. So I'll, I'll start by saying that, um, you know, I've been a filmmaker uh, for over two decades. Um, I've had the privilege of traveling the world uh, many times and witnessing all kinds of uh, incredible and heartbreaking um, stories and meeting some incredible change makers. And I'm, what, what happened for me is that after the success of The Ghosts in Our Machine, um, which I hope you've seen, if you haven't, check it out. Um, you know, it had a wonderful uh, global impact campaign associated with it and a lot of exposure about the, the question of animal sentience. And uh, it's not a question, it's, it's a reality, it's truth. And it was about using the powerful platform of documentary to be a vehicle uh, to communicate with people globally and to be a bridge builder. Um, documentaries are powerful platforms to unveil new ideas and to motivate social change. And so after spending, uh, you know, probably five years of, of my life very committed to that film, I was really looking for a story uh, that was solution focused and that was viable and that was active and unfolding. And, you know, The Ghosts in Our Machine is a consciousness raising film um, about a big moral issue and question, but Meet the Future is about uh, a revolution that is underway. It's not science fiction anymore, it's reality. Um, and I have this quote up here by Winston Churchill because if you haven't already, you know, read that quote or seen it um, in the zeitgeist. Um, it, it's often cited as, you know, the uh, pro sort of this uh, prophetic um, statement that was made in 1932. Um, and here we are, uh, you know, all these years later, decades later, and this the birth of this industry, which is what Meet the Future is about, um, is actually, it has proliferated around the globe. There are pioneers on every continent. There are investors uh, all over the globe. And this is um, about, this film is about uh, an idea whose time has come. So meat harvested from animal cells will transform the food system. Um, Singapore is the first country in the world to regulate um, uh, cultured meat. So people in Singapore can actually uh, eat it, uh, purchase it and, and, and eat it. Um, meet the Future um, focuses in a sort of laser focused way on the entry point of one startup company. Um, and so back in 2016, I was really looking for that next big idea to, to wrap a, a film around. And I was lucky to um, be able to secure uh, the necessary behind the scenes um, uh, access uh, that is required to tell these stories with a company called Memphis Meats. And they've recently rebranded as Upside Foods. And here's a quote uh, from them. Now, as a filmmaker, of course, when you commit to these stories, there's no way that you can predict how that story will unfold. Um, so therefore it becomes a big risk for uh, the film industry, um, you know, broadcasters and funders to invest in something that could, you know, uh, evaporate. But what happened is that this story with Upside Foods, actually, um, there was tremendous uh, momentum. And we were lucky to uh, have that access and to be able to chart and map the rapid progression 
of this company as an entry point to represent the birth of an industry globally. So we aim to make meat that is better for humans and animals and will at scale produce less waste and dramatically fewer greenhouse gas emissions. We believe that the planet will be the ultimate beneficiary. So the film's been getting around and we've got a big, huge announcement coming in a few weeks. So please follow us. And um, I'm sorry, I can't let you know the juicy details today, um, but uh, there are very juicy details uh, coming up. And um, I would like to talk about the, the underpinnings, the moral, the social, ethical underpinnings um, as to why um, I focused on this film, uh, this story, why I made this film. So like I said, when, when I started talking, we are um, at the edge of, of a revel. We are, you know, there is a paradigm shift uh, taking place in the world. Um, from a climate emergency perspective, um, we need solutions that are viable and we, we need them now. Uh, we can't wait, um, you know, 50 years. Uh, we need to, um, to, really, to really move quickly uh, to solve some of the greatest issues um, that we're all facing, you know, um, dangerous uh, weather patterns, um, rising sea levels, um, uh, methane, uh, I mean, it's, you know, deforestation, it goes on and on. So animal agriculture occupies nearly half of the world's land surface. Um, and, you know, what is exciting um, about the advent and the birth of this industry is that it could solve, uh, and you'll notice that I said, it could. Um, obviously, we can't make any giant claims here because this doesn't exist uh, fully at scale yet. It's, it's, it's still something that is underway. Um, but it could solve some of the greatest issues of our times. And that's what um, interests me about it uh, from a, a social, political, and ethical, moral standpoint. So, um, I'll just read something here that uh, cultivated beef at scale is estimated to reduce land use by more than 95%, climate change emissions by 74 to 87%, and nutrient pollution by 94%. That's a game changer. If, in fact, uh, this does get off the ground at scale and um, becomes the new normal. So I'll just uh, wind down by saying that um, Meet the Future um, is a journey. It's character driven. It explores the moral and personal underpinnings. Uh, it follows pioneers over five years. And so that you could really humanize this subject matter. Otherwise, you know, it's really um, a science or business story. Um, I'm not a science or business storyteller, but this film, of course, uh, is about all of that. It brings together everything. It brings together um, issues of, um, you know, animal, environmental, and human justice issues, and it brings together an exciting uh, business story and an exciting, um, you know, food technology and science story that is helping to change the world. So that's my presentation and thank you. Let me just uh, get out of this sharing mode. Thank there we you. go. Thank you so much, Liz Marshall. I cannot recommend your films highly enough. They, 
they are beautiful and they are powerful. May, may we all be <laughs> both of those things. So now it is my pleasure to introduce John Sambomatsu. He is a PhD. We said that before. He's the editor of Critical Theory and Animal Liberation. Dr. Sambomatsu, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks uh, so much, <clears throat> Victoria. Um, so I want to begin by thanking Jen Wiglinski, uh, who has organized VegFest with that uh, group of volunteers. So everybody maybe can applaud out in virtual land. Um, and I want to say I'm really delighted to be on a panel with, uh, with such people. I mean, I admire the work that everybody is doing here. Uh, Glenn uh, and I are former colleagues. Uh, my friend Glenn, and um, I really enjoyed your presentation, Glenn. Liz um, did a fantastic uh, job on her last film, Ghosts in, in Our Machine, which I am really looking forward to. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing that new film. And finally, Victoria Moran, a very important voice in our, in our movement. So anyway, I'm delighted to be here. <clears throat> I am, of course, taking the contrarian view on this panel. I'm happy to do it. Um, I am the... Uh, the editor and uh, of, um, clean meat hoax uh, website. So I'm going to be going in and out of um, screen share. It might be a little annoying to people, but I, I like to do that. So let me just uh, begin just a couple of quick slides here. Hopefully you are seeing um, my slideshow. If not, someone will speak up, right, Victoria? Um, <clears throat> So basically, my comments are around this theme, why cellular, cellular meats won't end animal agriculture, at least as it's developing right now. And um, most of my remarks, or, or many of them, are taken more or less from our website, cleanmeathoax.com. And there are over a dozen of us uh, critical animal studies people, so scholars and activists in animal advocacy, who are trying to raise some concerns about this technology, which has generally not been uh, greeted skeptically enough uh, in, in our view. So this, is, this of course is the problem. And um, I appreciate the eloquent remarks of my, uh, my, of my colleague, former colleague Glenn, and, and then also uh, Liz in laying out the problem. I mean, essentially we have this um, system uh, which I and others have called speciesism. It's a mode of producing human life organi organized around the control and exploitation and killing of other uh, beings. And uh, within this structure is the capitalist world system. And as a result of this mode of production, we are, we're at a point where we're destroying uh, the entire ecosystem as uh, the other panel has pointed out, uh, really, really and truly undermining the conditions for all life on earth. Now, uh, the animal agriculture and, and fisheries industries are, their destruct, the, the destruction that they are wrecking on the environment is much worse than, than climate change, uh, which is itself, as, as you pointed out, Glenn, one of the artifacts, partly an artifact of animal agriculture. Um, but in terms of biodiversity loss, uh, uh, resource depletion uh, and mass extinction, <clears throat> it's really our violence against animals that's the problem. Let me stop there. I'll stop sharing that for just a second. So, you know, <clears throat> now I wish that, that cellular meat was the magic bullet that would solve this problem, but I don't feel that it is. Um, otherwise, I'd be completely on board with it. You know, I'm not attached to labels like vegan or, or whatnot. I'm, I'm in, in favor of animal justice. Um, but at best, in my, my view, um, and I certainly could be wrong, but in my view, cultivated or cellular meats at best will reduce the rate of expansion of live animal meat consumption. They will not replace meat from conventionally raised animals anytime soon, if ever, <clears throat> not unless um, our attitudes and behavior towards animals as such, as you know, those, those attitudes are challenged. And that is a, a task of the animal advocacy movement, not the technologists who are not challenging that at all. Um, so that's, so that's why we're here. We're here today because there's this, uh, there's this crisis. And I, I describe this crisis as um, a legitimation crisis. So let me just share my screen again with you all. <clears throat> so these problems in animal agriculture and the fisheries industry, 
uh, have led to a breakdown of our mode of justifying this, this mass violence and exploitation, hence the legitimation crisis, right? Um, we see this in a variety of uh, forms throughout the, the culture. Uh, back in 2012, New York Times uh, organized a contest inviting readers to explain why it was ethical to eat meat. Right? Since then, locavorism has taken off uh, in the wake of uh, Michael Pollan's book, The Omnivore's Dilemma. We have hundreds, if not thousands of books promoting so-called humane meat, ethical meat, sustainable agriculture, animal agriculture, and so on. <clears throat> Um, the Whole Foods uh, Corporation has, as among, among other uh, organizations, but particularly Whole Foods, has capitalized on this uh, mania for so-called sustainable and so-called humane meat. Bruce Friedrich of the Good Food Institute, who I'll be mentioning in a moment, was, was one of the principals who was uh, instrumental uh, within the animal uh, welfare movement to promote the uh, so-called humane killing um, and uh, 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 the myth of, of, a, of a humane form of animal agriculture. And so these same people who are at the center of this effort uh, to lobby for what is now called clean meat or cellular meat. Uh, let me just pause there for, for just a moment. So basically because of this legitimation crisis, society at large and the meat industry are you know, everyone's doing everything they can to avoid dismantling the system. And in my view, cellular meat is part of this effort. I know that's paradoxical, but I'm going to explain why. <clears throat> now, in theory, cellular meat could have been part of um, a wider movement strategy to lay the animal economy to rest. However, because the effort is being run by entrepreneurial capitalists in collusion with the biggest institutional players in the meat industry, it's a problem. According to a new report released, I think just this week, but this month anyway, by McKinsey and Company, one of the world's largest management consulting firms, quote, I'm sorry, not quote yet. Uh, the best guess right now is that a decade from now, if all goes according to plan, if all goes according to plan, a decade from now, cellular meats will replace, quote, one half of 1% of the total market in meat. That's if all the rosy predictions that hold in 10 years, cellular meat will replace one half of 1% of the total market of meat. That means that between now and then, nine and 27 trillion animals will die violently at human hands in the meanwhile, because we're killing between one and three million, uh, trillion marine animals and uh, up to 60 billion land animals every single year. Now, as an animal advocate, I find that unacceptable. And in my view, whatever else the cellular meat juggernaut is, it is not a strategy for overcoming the system of human uh, violence against animals. So I don't think this is going to ultimately uh, help the animals very much. And the reason why is that cellular meats are being folded into a strategy to preserve the meat economy. It's very important that, that we understand that. Um, I'd like to show um, a brief clip actually from Liz's film uh, Meet the Future, which I'm really looking forward to, to seeing. It looks like a beautifully made movie. This is a 30-second clip I'm going to show you um, of Uma Valetti of Memphis Meats. Uh, I didn't, you just uh, explained, Liz, that it's now Upside Foods. Um, but uh, when he was with Memphis Meats, co-founder of that, uh, explaining why he signed a letter of agreement with the largest uh, meat trade organization. Um, so let me just uh, play that for you. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing my, my screen again. Thanks for your patience. Okay, so Uma Valetti, again, the uh, co-founder and CEO of Memphis Meats, and here is his signature with Barry Carpenter, president and CEO of the North American Meat Institute. So I just wanna play 30 seconds of his explanation of why he did this. I am signing a letter with the largest meat trade association of the world. Felt like the right thing to do. We are going to bring everybody under this tent. The meat industry knows that they can't meet the demand. If the demand for meat is going to double by 2050, there is no method of production at their disposal now that would satisfy that hunger for meat. Okay, so 
Valetti is saying in this um, passage that he wants to bring everybody under this tent, okay? Now, what that means in practice is creating a symbiotic relationship between the existing meat industry and the new cellular meat industry. And the reason for this is because both are needed in order to meet future demand. It's not, this is not going to replace conventional ad, animal agriculture. Um, so this long-term strategy of the meat and animal industry is to preserve a so-called diverse protein portfolio that will be made up of industrially, uh, uh, you know, factory farmed animals, uh, animals on from so-called humane smaller farms or medium-sized organic farms, um, fish and other marine animals taken from the oceans, uh, possibly trillions of insects, who by the way are conscious, quite amazing, extraordinary being. Up to trillions of uh, insects will be, quote, harvested for their protein. Plant-based foods are part of this mix. And then finally, meat grown synthetically from cell cultures. Matthew Walker, managing director at S2G Ventures, a high-tech venture capitalist firm investing in alternative protein proteins, has said, quote, we're taking a yes and yes and as opposed to an either or approach to the space. You will have animal-based meat plant-based meat, and you will have hybrids. Now, in, I'm 2000, signing oops, in 2019, Rene Vasilos, an agricultural economist with the Banyan Innovation Group, told attendees at the National Institute for Animal Agriculture, quote, and alternative proteins from insects to legumes, legumes to cell cultures are not something to view as a replacement for animal proteins, but as just another competitor in a huge global protein market. And we find this confirmed in various places uh, in the industry. Now, if you look at this, uh, the bottom there, this, this uh, quote, I found this in the Tri-State Livestock News a couple of years ago. <clears throat> I just want to draw attention to the, the uh, headline, how alternative proteins can support the animal agriculture industry. This is a really, really uh, crucial point. All right, let me stop that for a moment. So right now, already some of the biggest killers of animals on the planet are investing heavily in the alternative protein sector. Tyson Foods has invested in the cellular, cellular meat startups of Upside Foods as, and Future Meats. PHW Gruppe Lumen, uh, the German uh, uh, company, which is the largest killer of chickens in Europe, 350 million chickens a year, has invested in super meats. I mentioned Bruce Friedrich, he himself, uh, and he is you know, one of the most important people um, who's, who's created this lobby for this tech, new, new untested technology, <clears throat> has said, quote, that he wants to take ethics off the table. That's a direct quotation. He wants to take ethics off the table in our conversations about meat and animals. And he has made it clear, and I can give you the quotes later if we have time. Um, he's made it clear that this that cellular meat poses no threat, he has said, no threat whatsoever to regenerative animal agriculture or the so-called humane meat market. In other words, I've spoken to uh, Bruce Friedrich about this uh, a couple of years ago. In the world that, that he foresees, millions or billions of animals will continue to be killed for food. Now, Friedrich, of course, does argue and believe perhaps that this technology will at least replace factory farming, right? Unfortunately, though, the agri agribusiness interests themselves have made clear that they have no intention of getting rid of conventional animal agriculture, right? Um, so, and the reason is simply because otherwise they can't meet demand. And one of the problems, and I could talk about this if we have time later, is the way that the cellular meat space has developed is it's reinforcing meat culture as a whole by saying, repeating over and over again that meat, meaning animal flesh, is crucial to the human diet. It's a great source of nutrition. We love our meat. We need our meat. None of which is true. Okay. None of which is true. We did not need an alternative. Uh, we didn't need to grow uh, food in the vat. There have been many uh, plant based, delicious alternatives, nutritious alternatives for thousands of years. But at any event, Cargill, for example, the largest agribusiness company in the world, and one of the most destructive, has said, quote, Our goal is to provide a complete basket of goods to our customers. And we will do this by growing our traditional protein business, meaning factory farming, as well as entering into new proteins and investing in innovative alternatives. At Cargill, we recognize that meat is a core part of consumer diets and central to many cultures and traditions. 
are traditional proteins, they mean from live animals, as well as new innovations like cultured meats are both necessary to meet that demand. To, and in the same press release where Cargo was explaining it's investing in these new technologies, they, the uh, press release stated emphasize that Cargill has recently invested $600 million in factory farming. New investment. And it says that this, and they it's explicitly said that the reason they invested these $600 million is to underscore Car. this is a quote, to underscore Cargill's overarching commitment to animal protein. Now, does that sound to you like Cargill is planning to wind down its mass killing of animals anytime soon? There's simply no evidence that the meat companies are planning to get out of the business of, of exploiting and killing animals. Even, I mean, to bring the cellular meat thing up to scale, as we keep talking about, when will that be? How many decades from now? Last year, A.T. Kearney, the consulting firm, gave the best case scenario. It said that in 20 years from now, basically the total number of animals being killed will be about the same, possibly a little less than are being killed today. That's in 20 years. Now, remember, what McKinsey said, that in nine years, this new technology, if it goes well, uh, will uh, account for one half of 1% of the meat economy. So basically, uh, at the same time, we find cellular meat proponents deliberately reinforcing meat culture and this myth that we have to keep eating uh, flesh. At the very moment, ironically, right, that veganism and plant-based foods are finally becoming mainstream. At the very moment when people are finally opening up to the idea that plant-based uh, food, which by the way, uh, you know, there's so many uncertainties, uh, Glenn, as you were pointing out about this new technology, in none of the studies of, that I've seen do even the rosiest projections of cellular meat come close to the ecological savings of plant-based foods. Plant-based agriculture is the most ecologically sustainable way to produce food, protein, calories for human beings. Cellular meats will certainly be better than uh, live animals, but not as good as plant-based foods. So to conclude, and I'm sorry to go on a little long, you know, uh, from my perspective at any rate, the only viable solution to the problems that we face is to really challenge uh, what I call human species right, which is this idea that we have a, a right uh, to, to dominate, uh, exploit, and kill other beings. And that has to be really central. And unfortunately, that, that idea is not being made central by this lobby. In fact, it's being de-emphasized there's always this talk about how health, the health benefits of cellular meat, the ecological benefits. The animals, well, they're kind of mentioned, but they're not central because who cares? After all, there are only trillions of animals we're killing. So anyway, thank you for listening to my provocative uh, remarks. And now I turn it back to the chair. Thanks to everyone. I think you're all provocative. You could uh, take that act on the road, the provocative trio. So we've gone a bit over. We have 10 minutes and five questions so far. So uh, could I get a show of hands on the panelists if we run over up to about 10 minutes? Are you all okay with that? Okay, cool. All right. Then um, I I'm going to ask the last question first. This is for John because it does. Um, relate to what you've been talking about. Uh, this comes from Paulina and she says, there have been vegetarians since Pythagoras, if not eaten, but most people still eat meat. How can we convince people to care when they just don't? You know, absolutely. And I wanna say, you know, I wanna practice a little humility here and say, you know, I don't have the magic bullet myself. I don't have a strategy. Um, for, for changing this. And I understand that's why a lot of uh, animal advocates have, are, are uh, drawn to this new technology because they think that, as, you know, as, as uh, Paulina points out, yeah, I mean, since Pythagoras have been vegetarians. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, as I said, if this, if this whole thing was being unfolded within a, a robust animal rights movement that was really getting at what I see to be the core psychological and cultural issues, then I might be in favor of it. But as it is, I'm I'm really concerned that it's 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 gonna it's already being co-opted by corporate agribusiness, and that it's um, it's reinforcing the idea that we have to keep eating animals forever, which is just uh, silly. But anyway, to grant the point, yeah, I don't I don't have the I have some ideas for strategy, but uh, that would take another hour to talk. About. <laughs> okay, Liz or Glenn, does either of you want to comment on that question? Okay, Liz. I agree. Uh, tenfold uh, with the question 
because, um, you know, as someone that has also traveled the globe extensively um, for my work over the decades, um, the vast, vast majority of our species consumes animal protein, um, often on a daily basis. Um, it is very complex subject matter, and I don't think there. I don't think it's helpful to have black and white thinking around this. I think that we need all tactics. I think we need to. I agree with the ethics, John. Um, I'm vegan myself, um, but I th and I also agree with the argument and the critique of capitalism, um, the levers of capitalism creating you know, arguably transformation and paradigm shift and disruption um, is a fascinating angle, which is what Meet the Future of the Film is all about. And so I've been very steeped and immersed in this, the emergence and the questions of this, the, the birth of this industry for about five years. And so there's tons of questions and, and I think that's great. And that's the, that is the purpose of a film is to be that platform for discussion and debate and, and bridge building. And, um, and, and that's really who I am and that's what motivates me. But ultimately I'm a pragmatist. I don't believe in the utopian. We don't have time for a utopian aspiration of a vegan world. It's not gonna happen in the next 10 years. And, you know, 2050, everyone's talking about 2050 as this, you know, benchmark, but it's actually, we got to move faster. Um, everything is an emergency right now. Um, if you believe it's not, then please read up on climate science, um, you know, and if you're coming at it solely from the perspective of animal exploitation and wanting to save animals, that is an emergency. Uh, roughly 70 billion land animals are slaughtered annually for their flesh. Um, and the suffering is just unbearable. So, and then from a human health zoonotic disease perspective, um, we need transformation within the actual system of a, a conventional animal agriculture. So I would argue that um, these innovators and pioneers um, are pragmatists who are using their skills um, to um, disrupt and transform a system that needs repair, that needs transformation, and, and that isn't going anywhere anytime soon. I agree with that part. But I think that industrial animal agriculture can be uh, radically revolutionized and changed within our lifetime. And I think that's really um, the crux of the argument here is whether or not you believe that it should be transformed or completely dismantled um, based on the fact that most people in the world eat meat. Do you, yeah, do just you like to, Go ahead, Glenn. I was just saying, like, you know, I, I wanna echo what Liz was just saying and, you know, also thank Liz and John for uh, uh, outstanding presentations and, and, you know, bringing up a lot of very, you know, valid points. The question, you know, how do we teach, you know, people to care is a great question is much, much more than just the topic we're talking about, right? I mean, that's one of our biggest problems, I think, in our world today. But bringing the focus to, you know, animal agriculture, um, John and I know from our, our institution that we were at together, there's theory and practice. And I agree, you know, with John's theory, you know, but practically, you know, as Liz said, I think anything we can do to decrease our reliance on animal agriculture Let's get started right now and let's let's educate people and let's hope that that, you know, momentum continues to pick up and continues to swing. Um, you know, Paul Shapiro in his book says, you know, we've tried to convert everybody to, you know, vegetarians and, 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 and vegans. It just, does, you know, it just hasn't worked. And so, you know, being practical, let's do all we can to uh, decrease our reliance as much as we can on animal agriculture. Okay, I, I, for me? No, I probably can't get another word in there. Well, I? let me ask you another question that's for you, and then you can bring your rebuttal in with this <laughs> one as well. Um, so this comes from Bob specifically for you. And he is saying, 
I don't understand the capitalism connection. I lived for a time in Maoist China, and I can tell you I would not want to have been a pig or chicken or even a cat or dog there. Yeah, amen, brother. Yes, I agree with that, certainly. I mean, look, I teach a seven-week class on capitalism, uh, you know, at the undergraduate level, and we only scratch the surface of the topic. So I, uh, I suggest, Bob, take the class. But I can't go into really, and if you go to our website, cleanmeathoax.com, at least you can see uh, critiques, uh, like a, we make the connection there between um, this technology and capitalism and why we should be a little bit suspicious of it. Just very, very briefly, I just want to say, um, uh, I respectfully disagree with this framing of we're, pragmatism. We're not hearing you well, John. Maybe a little closer to your mic. Oh, can you hear me now? Better, yes. Sorry, I was just saying on this, this uh, dichotomy between the utopians and the pragmatists, I really reject that. I mean, you know, we can get into the abolitionist movement against slavery, you know, and, and the, the pragmatists who wanted to reform slavery and those who said, no, we, it's just unacceptable. But I guess what I think what I was trying to say, actually, in my remarks is that this isn't a practical strategy that, we, that you know, that this that the cellular meat stuff is this untried technology that is decades away from replacing the system. Whereas, actually, if we all got on the same page and began advocating uh, for uh, animal justice and a plant based uh, economy and um, and so on, we could make progress. And actually, it occurred to me about the Pythagoras stuff. There are more vegetarians and vegans today in America, right? Just in the last 10 years, it's grown like 3,000%. So that's what I mean. It's like snatching victory, uh, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory to be pushing this technology when there's been enormous progress on, on the vegan front. That's all, I guess. Uh, I have other things, but I'm, I'm monopolizing <laughs> I know you guys are all wonderful. Let's see. Now, Marlene uh, has two questions uh, for Glenn, and I'll give them to you all at once. The first is, will people of all economic levels be able to afford cultured meat? And the second is, can cultured meat be made without growth hormones? So uh, thank you uh, for those questions. Really important questions, right? Uh, I think both of them are very, very important in terms of the economic levels. That's something that we need to, you know, consider as, you know, we develop uh, what I think is, is really a new industry. And so, you know, we th we're talking a little bit about capitalism here, you know, think about this new industry, lab grown meats, cellular meats, whatever you want to call it. Um, we have the opportunity, and that's part of the reason why at the end of my talk, I said, we need to talk to the you know, sociologists. How do we ensure that everybody can benefit from you know, this new industry? Can we have a new economic model so that everybody benefits? Can we bring the cost of this down so that people can actually grow meat in you know, their, their kitchen regardless of economical status? Now, it's, you know, it's not easy and I don't have the solutions, right? But we need to make sure that we involve others who can help you know, help that, uh, enable that solution. So um, my hope is the answer is yes. Um, right now, the answer is no. You know, and as John points out, you know, it's, it's going to be a while before um, this becomes mainstream. Uh, in regards to, you know, removing um, the growth factors, we can, um, in the hormones, we, we can remove growth, some of the growth hormones. We can replace them with uh, basically proteins that are grown in plants. And so we can get rid of the animal that way, but there are, you know, the building blocks that are needed for our, our, our cells and the tissue to grow. And so we can't replace, you know, the, the hormones or, you know, depending on, on your definition of, you know, exactly if you're talking about hormones and cells or growth factors, we can't replace the growth factors, um, get rid of them altogether. But what we can do is produce those growth factors in theory, in plants and get rid of the animal that produces those growth factors. Thank you. Now we have a question from Kathy. She says, it's a long way away, but I'm thinking about lab meat as a compassionate way to feed companion animals. If we're able to reduce dairy, then there will thankfully be fewer calves sent to become pet food. I wonder if companion animal foods might achieve government approval before human trials, Glenn or Liz? 
you know, um, just to start off, there are some companies right now in the lab grown meat, the cellular agriculture industry that are focused on that, on companion animal food. And so um, I, you know, I do think that uh, there is a significant opportunity there. Um, yeah. Cool. Because I've had cats. <laughs> And, you know, it's hard to open those little cans once you awaken to not wanting to eat animal foods Can yourself. I, I want, if Please I could just do. say, just Please. want to say, Liz, I don't know if you wanted to add anything, but um, this is actually an application of the technology that I support. I mean, producing uh, food, because I had a student who did a at WPI where I teach uh, who, who looked at the amount of uh, the number of animals who are killed to produce, to feed cats and dogs. And by the way, if you won't, if you have a cat, I mean, sorry, if you have a dog, you don't have to, dog does not have to eat animal products. Dogs are omnivores like us, they can be vegan. But in any event, cats are obligate carnivores, right? But uh, if you add up all the number of animals that are killed uh, to feed our cats and dogs, it would be like the fifth largest country in the world in terms of meat consumption. It is a huge, huge, huge issue. And so I just want to say, because everyone thinks I'm probably a bad person on this panel, but I do, I do support, I do support this technology uh, for our companion animals. Thank you. Let me just say, I know John well, and he is a good person. We all know Thanks. that. <laughs> So here's a talk about provocative. This comes from Jennifer. Would the panelists eat cultured meat? Why or why not? We'll just go around. We'll start with you, John, Liz, and Glenn. You know, you know, when I was uh, preparing for this this panel, I was my my secret question was for Glenn. I want to know what Glenn. What's kind of interesting is here we are at you know the New England Veg Fest. Why are we talking about this exactly? I mean, I, I know why, it's kind of rhetorical, but the people who are most enthusiastic about this technology, other than the entrepreneurs, are vegans and vegetarians who are the least likely to want it, right? They want everyone else to have it. And so I'm curious, Glenn, I don't think you're a vegan. I'd be curious to know whether you're eager to replace your animal products uh, with, with this kind of uh, animal product or cell product, because. Personally, it doesn't appeal to me, and I, I'm not planning to get any of it. I'll let Liz go first, and then I'll go. Sure. Uh, so uh, in following the story uh, over five years, um, I tried it twice. Um, you know, so, and I have a water bottle and a hoodie that says, um, first bite. So I'm part of this, you know, elite little tiny club that basically it's like going to the moon. Um, I didn't have any, the, so the reason I tried it as a vegan um, is for my work, but also more than that, obviously, because I wouldn't try, I wouldn't eat meat otherwise at all, um, at all. Um, but uh, I didn't have any moral, um, conflict um, around it. And um, will I, and so I've done a lot of um, international press about the film and every journalist asked me the same question. It became sort of predictable um, that I would get this question. So um, would I integrate this into my, you know, regular life diet? Um, when it's available to consumers? And the answer is 99.9% .9 no. Um, and the reason I have that tiny, tiny fraction is because if it, you know, ended up on my plate at someone's house, barbecue, whatever, um, I, I would, it's not a moral dilemma for me to taste it again or to have it at a dinner party or something like that. Um, but I don't, uh, I don't need to eat meat. I choose to not eat meat for ethical reasons. Um, and uh, I continue to live that way, um, you know, happily. So, um, and it's my daily form of activism. Um, it's the strongest daily practical way to be an activist. Um, as a filmmaker, um, that's also... Um, 
a, 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 an active way that I'm an activist. So that's my long answer. That was a lovely long answer. Thank you so much. And Glenn, we've been waiting with bated breath because you have been baited. <laughs> I would definitely, uh, without a doubt, eat cultured meat. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, John's question, you know, in, in terms of going back, you know, if we really want to cut back on animal agriculture, if we really want to, you know, cut back on the destruction of animal agriculture in regards to our environment, whether it's the land, the water, you know, uh, any, any, of, uh, any of those, we really need to attract the non-vegans, the non-vegetarians. And we really need to come up with a substitute for them, right? Because the fact of the matter is vegetarians and vegans are not you know, destroying our environment by partaking in animal agriculture, right? When I eat meat, which is much less than it was, you know, 10, 20 years ago, then yes, I am partaking, you know, partaking in that. And so how do we come up with a solution for the meat eaters? Because if we want to save our environment, you know, if we want to decrease in the number of, uh, you know, factory farms, we really need to find an alternative for the meat eaters, right? And so, you know, John, to your point, that's who we've got to, you know, we've got to target, um, and, and, and I hope we do. I'm a huge supporter of the Impossible Burger, you know, Impossible Meat Beyond Burger, Beyond Meat, made meatloaf with it before. You know, it's, uh, you know, is it the same? No. Is it close? Yes. You know, and is it a great substitute? Yes. Um, and, you know, love to see both of those, you know, continue to, to take off. Um, I'll just, I'd like to just uh, say one thing. I'm in a very unique position with this film because... Um, it's had a huge exposure in Canada, um, very high profile exposure. And we're right now strategizing for our international release uh, with news coming soon. So I've had a lot of opportunity to hear from meat eaters who've watched the film. And uh, basically overall the consensus I would say is that so many of them want to try it. Um, and the uniqueness that of, of, of a film is that it really serves a a, a purpose in society to, um, to help educate uh, the masses um, and, to, and, and to be that platform for debate and discussion and consciousness raising. So um, I would argue uh, with what you said, John, I think that um, meat eaters, the more that they understand what this is and that it's available and affordable and convenient, uh, convenient for them to purchase, I think more and more uh, people will um, be interested. And if I may just comment on that, I, the reason I disagree is, I mean, you can look at, you know, you, uh, Glenn, you mentioned Paul Shapiro, and I, you know, I have a lot of problems with Shapiro as well as with Bruce and uh, Friedrich and Wayne Faselli and these guys, because these were the people who were, who, the ones who say that we oh, we failed, the movement failed, or the ones who failed the movement. I mean, these are the people who are actually steering the movement. They failed, actually, uh, by, you know, claiming that we needed to take, move to, uh, you know, humane, animal, welfare-oriented uh, policies, you know, um, where, and that was their pragmatic solution, which failed, you know, because, you know, you can't, you can't wean a, a nation of alcoholics off of uh, alcohol by offering them finer bourbon and scotch, you know, artisanal, uh, beef and and so um, you know when we talk about quote meat eaters I was a meat eater a meat eater isn't something like in the genes right it's something that it's it's part of our cultural identity and therefore it can be changed there used to be slavers in this country now there aren't slavers anymore um, so and I, I know we're on the same I think uh, you know that we're on the same page we want this, the, the right things I mean the same things here you know um, but again, I, I just don't, I think it's, it's really a mistake to, for our movement, and I'm speaking to animal advocates here and vegans, I think it's a mistake for us to be paying so much attention to the cellular meat stuff. Let the, I mean, there, there's a, this is a billion dollar juggernaut. It's going to go on regardless. Our job, as I see it in the animal advocacy movement, is to change, it's to make people care. You know, it's what you were saying, Glenn, you know, that is our job. I'm not going to get, I'm not going to pin my hopes to this 
of technology. I don't think people should do that. Thank you. I don't know if the uh, convener gets to answer Jennifer's question, but I wanted to answer this one too, because it reminded me when I first was looking at, at veganism a very, very long time ago, and the late Jay Dinshaw, founder of the American Vegan Society, talked about six reasons why people would go vegan. We, we know about three and talk about them all the time, ethics, health, environment, but he also added spirituality, economics and aesthetics. And it was that last one, the aesthetics one that came up for me, why I just don't think I could eat it. I remember early, even before I was vegan, I was just vegetarian. And I was so excited that a restaurant had on its menu veggie burger. It was like, woohoo. Well, it was a hamburger with some kind of hamburger helper in it. And I took one bite and it was just so aesthetically uncomfortable that I'm just not looking to do that again. So I'd love to go around and just ask each of our esteemed panelists um, just for a, a close, just a minute or two minutes on what you want this audience to know and what you think is important going forward. We'll do it alphabetically. Glenn? <laughs> Um, so I, I very much enjoyed being part of this uh, panel. It's been fantastic. Um, and I, you know, very much respect and appreciate uh, Liz and John's uh, point of view and all that they, you know, shared with us. In regards to, you know, my closing message, I, I just go back to, you know, I think uh, a couple of things. One, you know, we need to teach people how to care, you know, and um, care for each other and care for animals and care for others. Um, you know, that's so important. Um, and, you know, I hope that we can convince the meat eaters that, you know, this is an, a, a substitute for them, because I think we need to, you know, reduce our reliance on animal agriculture. And while, you know, it'd be great if we could all just, you know, if it was a binary thing and we just flip the switch and turn it tomorrow, it's probably not going to happen. And so, um, you know, I want to keep on going towards doing what we can, uh, you know, in the practical sense um, to reduce our reliance on animal agriculture. Thank you so very much. Now, when I said alphabetical, I don't know if I meant first name or last name. So I'm going to go with last name. I'm going to go to Liz. Uh, yes. So thanks so much. Uh, it's great to meet you, John and Glenn. And so nice to see you again, Victoria your beautiful smile. Uh, thanks for moderating and hello to everyone uh, listening to this. Um, it's food for thought, literally. So um, I think, you know, my message really is keep your mind open. Um, I don't think it's helpful to have black and white thinking in, in our world as it currently is. Uh, we are you know, on the brink of a new era, we need solutions that are viable, that are underway, that will truly um, help us all, you know, uh, the animals, humans, and Mother Earth. We need to uh, move quickly and we need, you know, things that we can trust, obviously. But um, keep your mind open. Um, I think that, uh, you know, there are in the toolkit. Uh, there are so many tactics and um, one should not be rejected uh, for one other sort of approach. We need to uh, bridge build and we need to work together and we need to save the animals and we need to save ourselves in this planet. Thank you, Liz Marshall. And John, last word. Yeah, so I want to echo my, my fellow panelists and thanking you all um, for your, your wonderful thoughtful remarks and, and again, Victoria, for being a great moderator, actually. You know, it's not an easy job. You did a great job. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess just in closing, I would, I would uh, urge people to look at our website, um, cleanmeathoax.com. Um, I agree, black and white thinking isn't helpful, um, but uh, I don't think it's, I, I think what I see black and white thinking, where I see that is mostly in the proponents of this new technology who never seem to admit that there are problems with it uh, politically or culturally or spiritually. Um, and so I just, I just urge everyone who's watching this to look into this more carefully and not to just take it 
uh, for granted. And um, the critiques that we raise on our website, I, you know, I'm not sure time will tell whether they are, they're uh, valid or not, but I think that they are worth considering. So that's all, that's all I'll say. So thank you again. And thank you again, Jen, who just joined us. Thank you all so much. And if you would like to uh, keep up with our esteemed panelists, um, lizmars.com and clean-meathoax.com. Now, Glenn just sent me his department website and it's very long. So for uh, <laughs> sharing audibly, I don't think that's gonna work, but I'm sure that Jen, who has all the technology under control, will be able to put that somewhere that you can find it. And I am Main Street Vegan all over the place. And my website is MainStreetVegan.net. Thanks to everybody who presented. Jen and all of your team at New England Veg Fest for making this work so seamlessly. And thanks to everybody who's listening. We're all needed to get out there and change the world. All the best. Yeah, thank you. And thank you very much, Victoria, for all of your role in this and moderating. And yes, we will have information on all the panelists on our website at nevegfest.org. And for anyone who joined late, this video will continue to be available on our Facebook page and on the website as well. Yeah, thank you all so much. Bye all. Thank you everyone.